Learn English through stories. The Queen of Spades. Chapter 3. Lisa Aveto Ivanovna had scarcely taken off her hat and cloak when the countess sent for her and again ordered her to get the carriage ready. The vehicle drew up before the door and they prepared to take their seats. Just at the moment when two fat men were assisting the old lady to enter the carriage, Lizaveta saw her engineer standing close beside the wheel. He grasped her hand. Alarm caused her to lose her presence of mind, and the young man disappeared, but not before he had left a letter between her fears. She concealed it in her glove, and during the whole of the drive, she neither saw nor heard anything. It was the custom of the countess, when out for an airing in her parish, to be constantly asking such questions as, Who was that person that met us just now? What is the name of this bridge? What is written on that signboard? On this occasion, however, Lisa Vader returned such gay and absurd answers that the countess became angry with her. What is the matter with you, my dear? She exclaimed. Have you taken leave of your senses, or what is it? Do you not hear me or understand what I say? Heaven be thanked, I am still in my right mind, and speak plainly enough. Lisa Vedu Ivanovna did not hear her. On returning home, she ran to her room and drew the letter out of her glove. It was not sealed. Lisa Vedu read it. The letter contained a declaration of love. It was tender, respectful, and copied word for word from a German novel. But Lisa Vedu did not know anything of the German language and she was quite delighted, for all that. The letter caused her to feel exceedingly uneasy. For the first time in her life, she was entering into secret and confidential relations with a young man. His boldness alarmed her. She reproached herself for her imprudent behavior, and knew not what to do. Should she cease to sit at the window, and by assuming an appearance of indifference towards him, put a check upon the young officer, his desire for further acquaintance with her. Should she send his letter back to him, or should she answer him in a cold and decided manner? There was nobody to whom she could turn in her perplexity, for she had neither female friend nor adviser. At length, she resolved to reply to him. She sat down at her little writing table, took pen and paper, and began to think. Several times, she began her letter, and then tore it up. The way she had expressed herself seemed to her either too inviting or too cold and decisive. At last, she succeeded in writing a few lines with which she felt satisfied. I am convinced, she wrote, that your intentions are honorable and that you do not wish to offend me by any imprudent behavior. But her acquaintance must not begin in such a manner. I return you your letter and I hope that I shall never have any cause to complain of this undeserved slight. The next day, as soon as Herman made his appearance, Lisa Veda rose from her embroidery, went into the drawing room, opened the ventilator, and threw the letter into the street, trusting that the young officer would have the perception to pick it up. Herman hastened forward, picked it up, and then repaired to a confectioner list shop. Breaking the seal of the envelope, he found inside it his own letter and Lisa Veda's reply. He had expected this, and he returned home, his mind deeply occupied with his intrigue. Three days afterwards, 
a bright-eyed young girl from a mill inner s establishment brought Lisa Vady a letter. Lisa Vady opened it with great uneasiness, fearing that it was a demand for money, when suddenly she recognized Herman as handwriting. You have made a mistake, my dear, said C. This letter is not for me. Oh, Des, it is for you, replied the girl, smiling very knowingly. Have the goodness to read it. Lisa Veda glanced at the letter. Homan requested an interview. It cannot be, she cried, alarmed at the audacious request and the manner in which it was made. This letter is certainly not for me, and see pour it into fragments. If the letter was not for you, why have you torn it up? said the girl. I should have given it back to the person you sent it. Be good enough, my dear, said Lisa Veda, disconsuited by this remark, not to bring me any more letters for the future, and tell the person you sent you that he ought to be ashamed. But Herman was not the man to be thus put off. Every day Lisa Veda received from him a letter sent now in this way, now in that. They were no longer translated from the German. Herman wrote them under the inspiration of passion and spoke in his own language, and they bore full testimony to the inflexibility of his desire and the disordered condition of his incontrollable imagination. Lisa Veta no longer thought of sending them back to him. She became intoxicated with them and began to reply to them, and little by little her answers became longer and more affectionate. At last she threw out of the window to him the following letter. This evening there is going to be a ball at the embassy. The countess will be there. We shall remain until two o'clock. You have now an opportunity of seeing me alone. As soon as the countess is gone, the servants will very probably go out, and there will be nobody left but the Swiss. But he usually goes to sleep in his lodge. Come about half past eleven. Walk straight upstairs. If you meet anybody in the anteroom, ask if the countess is at home. You will be told, no, in which case there will be nothing left for you to do but to go away again. But it is most probable that you will meet nobody. The maid servants will all be together in one room. On leaving the anteroom, turn to the left and walk straight on until you reach the countess's bedroom. In the bedroom, behind a screen, you will find two doors. The one on the right leads to a cabinet, which the countess never enters. The one on the left leads to a corridor, at the end of which is a little winding staircase. This leads to my room. The maid servants will all be together in one room. On leaving the anteroom, turn to the left and walk straight on until you reach the countess's bedroom. In the bedroom, behind a screen, you will find two doors. The one on the right leads to a cabinet, which the countess never enters. The one on the left leads to a corridor, at the end of which is a little winding staircase. This leads to my room. On the lookout for a belated passenger, Hallman was enveloped in a thick overcoat and felt neither wind nor snow. At last, the countess's carriage drew up. Herman saw two footmen carry out in their arms the bent form of the old lady, wrapped in sable fur, and immediately behind her, clad in a worn mantle, and with her head ornamented with a wreath of fresh flowers. Followed Lee Zorveda. The door was closed. 
The parrot rolled away heavily through the reeling snow. The porter shut the street door. The windows became dark. Herman began walking up and down near the deserted house. At length he stopped under a lamp and glanced at his watch. It was twenty minutes past eleven. He remained standing under the lamp, his eyes fixed upon the watch, impatiently waiting for the remaining minutes to pass. At half past eleven precisely, Herman ascended the steps of the house and made his way into the brightly illuminated vestibule. The porter was not there. Herman hastily ascended the staircase, opened the door of the anteroom, and saw a footman sitting asleep in an antique chair by the side of a lamp. With a light form step, Herman passed by him. The drawing room and dining room were in darkness, but a feeble reflection penetrated thither from the lamp in the anteroom. Herman reached the Countess. S bedroom, before a shrine, which was full of old images, a golden lamp was burning. Faded stuffed chairs and divans with soft cushions stood in melancholy symmetry around the room, the walls of which were hung with china silk. On one side of the room hung two portraits painted in Paris by Madame Lebrun. One of these represented a stout, red-faced man of about forty years of age, in a bright green uniform and with a star upon his breast. The other, a beautiful young woman, with an aquiline nose, forehead curls, and a rose in her powdered hair. In the corners stood porcelain shepherds and shepherdesses, Dining room clocks from the warp shop of the cell abraded Lefroy, band boxes, roulettes, fans, and the various playthings for the amusement of ladies that were in vogue at the end of the last century, when Montgolfier, S. Balloons, and Mesmer, S. Magnetism, were the rage. Herman stepped behind the screen. At the back of it stood a little iron bedstead. On the right was the door which led to the cabinet. On the left, the other which led to the corridor. He opened the ladder and saw the little winding staircase which led to the room of the poor companion. But he retraced his steps and entered the dark cabinet. The time passed slowly. All was still. The clock in the drawing room struck twelve. This strokes echoed through the room one after the other, and everything was quiet again. Herman stood leaning against the cold stove. He was calm. His heart beat regularly, like that of a man resolved upon a dangerous but inevitable undertaking. One o'clock in the morning struck, then two and he heard the distant noise of carriage wheels. An involuntary agitation took possession of him. The carriage drew near and stopped. He heard the sound of the carriage steps being let down. All was bustle within the house. The servants were running hither and thither. There was a confusion of voices, and the rooms were lit up. Three antiquated chambermaids entered the bedroom, and they were shortly afterwards followed by the countess, who, more dead than alive, sank into a Voltaire armchair. Herman peeped through a chink. Lisa Vato Ivanovna passed close by him, and he heard her hurried steps as she hastened up the little spiral staircase. For a moment his heart was assailed by something like a pricking of conscience, but the emotion was only transitory, and his heart became petrified as before. The countess began to undress before her looking-glass. Her rose-bedecked cap was taken off, 
and then her powdered wig was removed from off her white and closely cut hair. Hairpins fell in showers around her. Her yellow satin dress, brocaded with silver, fell down at her swollen feet. Herman was a witness of the repugnant mysteries of her toilet. At last, the countess was in her nightcap and dressing gown, and in this costume, more suitable to her age, she appeared less hideous and deformed. Like all old people in general, the countess suffered from sleeplessness. Having undressed, she seated herself at the window in a Voltaire armchair and dismissed her maids. The candles were taken away, and once more the room was left with only one lamp burning in it. The countess sat there, looking quite lello, mumbling with her flaxed lips and swaying to and fro. Her dull eyes expressed complete vacancy of mind, and, looking at her, one would have thought that the rocking of her body was not a voluntary action of her own, that was produced by the action of some concealed galvanic mechanism. Suddenly the death-like face assumed an inexplicable expression. The lips ceased to tremble. The eyes became animated. Before the countess stood an unknown man. Do not be alarmed, for heaven is sake. Do not be alarmed, said he in a low but distinct voice. I have no intention of doing you any harm. I have only come to ask a favor of you. The old woman looked at him in silence, as if she had not heard what he had said. Herman thought that she was death, and bending down towards her ear, he repeated what he had said. The aged countess remained silent as before. You can ensure the happiness of my life, continued Herman, and it will cost you nothing. I know that you can name three parts in order. Herman stopped. The countess appeared now to understand what he wanted. She seemed as if seeking for words to reply. It was a joke. She replied at last. I assure you it was only a joke. There is no joking about the matter, replied Herman angrily. Remember Chaplitsky, whom you help to win. The countess became visibly uneasy. Her features expressed strong emotion but they quickly resumed their former immobility. Can you not name me these three winning cards? Continued Herman. The countess remained silent. Herman continued. For whom are you preserving your secret? For your grandsons. They are rich enough without it. They do not know the worth of money. Your cards would be of no use to a spendthrift. He who cannot preserve his paternal inheritance will die in want, even though he had a demon at his service. I am not a man of that sort. I know the value of money. Your three parts will not be thrown away upon me. Come, he paused and tremblingly awaited her reply. The countess remained silent. Herman fell upon his knees. If your heart has ever known the feeling of love, said he, if you remember its rapture, if you have ever smiled at the cry of your newborn child, if any human feeling has ever entered into your breast, I entreat you by the feelings of a wife, a lover, a mother, by all that is most sacred in life not to reject my prayer. Reveal to me your secret. Of what use is it to you? Maybe it is connected with some terrible sin, with the loss of eternal salvation, with some bargain with the devil. Reflect, you are old. You have not long to live. I am ready to take your sins upon my soul. 
only reveal to me your secret. Remember that the happiness of a man is in your hands, that not only I, but my children and grandchildren will bless your memory and reverence you as a saint. The old countess answered not a word. Herman rose to his feet. You old hack, he exclaimed, grinding his teeth. Then I will make you answer. With these words, he drew a pistol from his pocket. At the sight of the pistol, the countess for the second time exhibited strong emotion. She shook her head and raised her hands as if to protect herself from the shot. Then she fell backwards and remained motionless. Come, an end to this childish nonsense, said Herman, taking hold of her hand. I ask you for the last time, will you tell me the names of your three parts, or will you not? The countess made no reply. Herman perceived that she was dead. Thank you for listening to today's story on Learning List 724. To improve your English vocabulary and comprehension, we recommend listening to this story multiple times. By repeating the story and practicing the words and phrases, you will better understand and remember them. Keep practicing and see your English skills grow. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe to our channel, and leave a comment below. See you in the next video.